thankful for the privilege of gathering with God's people to worship Him. Also thankful for um, those words you shared, Brother Wendell, how God longs for us to have to be at peace, at peace with Him and at peace with each other. I believe it ties in with my message this morning. I believe God does get tired of our racket sometimes. I've titled the message this morning, The Danger of Anger. It's been a while since we were back in Matthew 5, and I'd like to go back there again this morning. But that's the title for my message, The Danger of Anger. I like to think of that a little bit. Anger is only one letter difference than danger. We don't maybe think of that right away because of the beauty of our English language. It, you know, we, it should say the danger of anger or <laughs> the danger of anger. But no, it's the danger of anger. But there's only one letter difference. And as, I was, as I was meditating on this, I, um, God gave me a little quote I would, I would like to throw out here this morning, and maybe you want to write it down and meditate on it. But anger is an emotion given by God, but driven by the devil. And I say that because anger, there, anger is a, actually an emotion that God gave us, and there's nothing wrong with anger in itself. The word anger does not specify the intensity of it or sometimes it's right sometimes it's wrong but it's an emotion that God gave us that when I see something wrong it pumps a little bit of adrenaline in there and says I'm going to do something about that it's the way anger is what God uses to rise us to action but the devil also knows he can use that. And so that's why anger is an emotion given by God, but driven by the devil. And so the devil loves to take a hold of that emotion and just twist that thing and, and, and spin us out of control. You know, anger is what's in us, the response that when I see a child get abused, wrongfully used, I'm going to do something about it if I can. So wait a minute, that's not happening. You know, if I, would, if I would see someone, even in town, just beating up on their child, I don't know what I'd do, but I'd do something. I'd at least step up and say, no, wait a minute, you can, no, back off, you can't do that. You know, if it wouldn't, that's because of an anger, of, an emotion of anger that steps up. Say, that's unjust. And if it wouldn't be for that, we'd be like, well, that's too bad, you know, it shouldn't happen. But we do nothing about it. God wants us to use anger in a positive way to step up, to take action within the premises that he gives us where we can. But many, many times that anger gets thrown out. We, 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 we harbor that and we act on it in ways that are not God's ways. That's why I believe it says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Be ye angry... And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. We'll all face that emotion of anger, and some of us more than others. But what are we going to do with it? Are we going to sin? Or are we going to give it to God? Are we going to respond in right, in a right way? You know, I found as I was in the process of studying for this message, there was three specific times where I got, I, I was put to the test of anger. And the first one was, again, I'm sorry for being a stuck record, but it was with my sheep. Because I just moved them to a new pasture, right where they loved to be, where the grass was trimmed and just had a couple days of regrowth. They loved those new shoots. And as I drove out my driveway, I couldn't do anything about it. I had to leave. As I drove out my driveway, I look out there. This is like three hours after I moved him. 
And they're not in that pastor, they're in another pastor. And I admit, there was some anger that welled up inside me. And I, I didn't yell, but I, I think I mumbled some things. And I definitely thought, I started doing some name calling, you know. And, and I'm not saying that's good, it's not a good thing, it's a, it's a problem I have. And then I had to stop and say, okay, wait a minute. And I actually decided probably the names I was calling them weren't even accurate. It's probably, I should have called them intelligent and thick-headed and maybe perverse, but I don't know. But anyway, that's the thing, that's a response to anger. And I had to check myself and say, wait a minute, what, what kind of a response am I having here? And I'd actually reminded myself that maybe it was an accident because maybe someone didn't see the fence. And I actually think that's probably what happened after, from what my son told me, where the fence was down. Probably it was an accident, probably someone didn't recognized the fence was there and went through it and then of course everyone followed. But it was an anger. What am I going to do with it? How am I going to respond? And the other times I, I, was, I was faced with anger, it, it was totally a righteous anger. But I felt it well up inside me. And I had to say, no, wait a minute. I need some time. I need some time. I need some space. How am I going to respond? How am I going to respond to this? I believe it was Satan's way of trying to trip me up. And I thank God that His grace was sufficient. But this happens regularly for us. Sometimes we don't stop and think about it. We just respond. Someone has said that there are three typical responses for anger. Or when someone is angry. And I... I think it's fairly, it's fairly good, well said. One of them is, is when I'm angry, I clam up. I'm just not going to talk to him anymore. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk to you. The other one is blow up. And we see that way too often. He made me angry. I gave him a piece of my mind. He didn't need a piece of my mind. Blow up. And the third one is, it's an option. It's the superior way to deal with anger, and that's to grow up. You know, we can learn. We can learn. We can stop. We can say, wait a minute. You know, maybe that wasn't right. But how am I going to respond? That hurt me. But let's think this through. How am I going to respond? Anger is an emotion given by God, but driven by the devil. Psalm 71, uh, sorry, Psalm 7, verse 11 says, God judges the righteous. And God is angry with the wicked every day. God also has emotion. We were created in His image. But God has the right to be angry. And He doesn't just get upset with people for no reason at all. But it's when they are set on their wicked way. When they are determined to go their own ways, when there's sin in their lives, it makes Him angry. God is angry with the wicked every day. So coming back to Matthew chapter 5, I'd like to remind us again a little bit of the setting. Jesus was on the mountain. Disciples had gathered around him. And, and he was teaching them. I think there was a whole host of them. There was a multitude of other people that were listening in. They were wanting to hear what Jesus had to say. But there's something different about Jesus. He wasn't like another rabbi, like most of the other rabbis. His word carried weight and authority. He lived what he preached. He cared for the down and the out. He spent a lot of time with the publicans and sinners. And it seemed, it seemed like he was offering grace to them. But he spoke harsh and condemning words to the religious leaders. You know, the Pharisees, they accused him of breaking the law. They didn't think he kept the Sabbath like he, that, 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 like he should. You know, I, I think it's fair to say that there was probably some honest people, some people who really wanted to know truth. They had some questions. You know, what is, what is truth? Or what's different? Somehow, it doesn't seem, he's not upholding the law like the Pharisees teach. 
What is truth? And so they come, they want to li they listen, they want to know. And Jesus tells them, I didn't come to destroy the law. You know, the Pharisee says, I don't say I don't keep the law. He said, I'm not coming to destroy the law, but I'm here to fulfill it. And that's in Matthew 5, 17. I'm not here to destroy, but I'm here to bring it to pass. I want you to understand the heart of God. He's calling us to holiness. And so in the, in the following verses, he gives us a number of very practical examples how he's taking the old law and the laws that the Pharisees upheld. And he's saying, this is the law. This is what you stand by. But this is what I'm telling you that it means. Lifting him to a higher standard. And then he goes on to say in verse 20, that unless our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, well, there's no way we'll enter to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees, they had their laws, they had their rituals, they held to them, at least when people were watching. But their heart was not right with God. They were not doing because of a love for God, but because of whatever, honor or what people thought. And I believe Jesus is bringing that out in these next verses. And so I'd like to read Matthew 5, 21 to 26. And remember here, he's, he's t really dealing with anger in a lot of these verses. And bringing out the point that the seed of murder starts with the thoughts in our, in our minds. Verse 21, You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, that thou shalt by no means come out until thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. So the elders had recognized the commandment, thou shalt not kill. They held to that. They said it was important. But to them, they felt justified. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't cut anybody's throat. So I'm doing okay. Okay. But in their heart, they harbored bitterness. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. I heard a man say last Sunday how he was in a prison. And he was given the opportunity to, to interact with the prisoners. And he walked up to a cell and he asked them if they would like to have a Bible study. And one of the men looked at him and said... And anyway, informed him in no uncertain terms he had no interest in a Bible study. And he said, in fact, you come close enough, I'll slit your throat. A man who was filled with anger. I don't know, that's probably why he was in prison. I don't know. Murder starts with the thoughts in my heart. He didn't kill that man, but he would have loved to. The elder said that who kills is in danger of the judgment. So what judgment is this talking about? In Deuteronomy 16, 18, God told the Israelites that they were supposed to set up judges and officers throughout, throughout their tribes, and they shall judge the people with judgment. So God said you're supposed to set up judges 
that are supposed to make honest judgments. I think this is what that was talking about. The old said, thou shalt not kill. But if you kill, you're going to be in danger of being hauled before the judge. And you're going to have to give account to that. So what was going to be the penalty for murder? In Leviticus 24, 21, God had told the Israelites, And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. God had made provision for the, for the Israelites that if they accidentally killed a man, if they were chopping wood and the axe had flew off and killed their neighbor, they had killed innocent blood, and so the law required them to be killed, but they could run for the city of refuge. And if they made it to the city of refuge, their life would be spared because they had done it innocently. But if a man was angry with his brother and he goes and he slits his throat or he hits him over the head, the law provided no grace for that. They could run to the city of refuge, but once the judge found out what had gone on, their, their life was, was to be killed. That was the law. Why was the penalty so high for killing a man? Genesis 9, 6, God said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Man is made in the image of God, man and woman. We're made in the image of God. And for a human being to say, you're not fit to live anymore, is an insult to God. It's an insult to the Creator who chose to make Him. Not one of us were made by chance or by accident. But from the moment we were conceived, it was because of God that life began. God allowed the life to happen. He made life to happen. He chose life to take place. And from that moment of conception, if a man decides that that life is not worth living, whether it's a day old, two days old, an abortion, or whether it's an adult. It's an insult to God. It's an insult to the Creator who chose to give life, and it's an insult to God because that life was made in the image of God. And I'm saying you're not fit to live. You'd be better to die. God says the penalty is high. To take blood, man's blood, you give your blood for it. So someone might ask, well then why, then why were the Israelites commanded to kill their enemies? You know, in the Old Testament, God chose to use His people and He used the heathen nations to punish sin. God never destroyed a nation because he wanted more real estate. He didn't, he didn't just send the Israelites out to fight their enemies because he wanted more real estate for them. You know, I, we know, we know what that's like. There's countries that do that. They go and kill their neighbors because they want their land. It's not why God ordered the Israelites to kill their enemies. It was because of sin. It was because of sin. It was always judgment of God on sin. I believe it was Abraham. God had told Abraham, he said, someday this will be your land and your descendants will live here. But he said, not now. Because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. They're a sinful nation. They're walking away from me. But I'm not quite done. Now, they haven't quite reached the point where I, can't, I have to punish them for their sin. That time is coming. And then at that point, you will destroy them and I will give it to you. God also, we also see God using a heathen nation to punish the Israelites when they rejected God and when they turned away from Him. We never see the Israelites lose a battle when they followed God. Never. 
No. It wasn't that God wasn't smart enough or not strong enough to deliver them. No. It was because they sinned and they walked away from God. That God required or worked things out so that their, their blood would be shed. I think of only one time when God required bloodshed and the life of another person when they had not sinned. And that was Jesus. That's the only time. Jesus had to give his life. Not because he sinned, but because you and I sinned. And he gave his life so that we could be redeemed. So that we could be reconciled back to God. God's heart cry this morning is that we be reconciled to God. That relationship would be healed again. And God's cry for us this morning is that our relationships would be restored with each other. So Jesus really didn't introduce a new standard when he addresses this anger issue. In Leviticus, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 9. This was in the law itself. We don't, we don't hear about this very often. And it must be that the, the scribes and Pharisees kind of forgot about this, these verses. Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. In other words, if he's sinning, you should love him enough to, to speak up and not be part of it. Verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So this really was not something new. Jesus was only reaffirming what God had already said in the old law. That you should love your neighbor as yourself. And don't hate your, your neighbor in your heart. So verse 22, going back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Jesus addressed the law that they felt that as long as they didn't take someone's life, they're okay. Jesus says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause... So you might say, well, why does he say without a cause? And I heard some explanations for that, various ones already. We usually think we do have a cause, right? If I'm angry with my brother, yeah, it's because I have a reason to be angry. Didn't Cain say that? I think he did. I can't think of the words right now. I think that was Cain's response. Maybe I'm thinking of someone else. No, it's Jonah. Sorry, it's Jonah. I have every right to be angry. Is there, do we ever have a reason to be angry at our brother? Well, I would say maybe yes. If we think of it that anger is an emotion that God gives us. When God is slandered or his holiness is violated, I think we do have a reason to be angry. You know, Jesus, we see Jesus expressing anger a few times in his ministry. But it was never because you hurt me. That wasn't true what you said. It was because they violated his father. You don't talk like that about my father. I remember being in a conversation with a person one time, and I... I think I felt some anger, and I, I just said, no, you don't talk like that about my Jesus. It was, it was slanderous words they were saying, and they knew better. I said, you don't talk like that about my Jesus. So maybe there is a cause for some anger with my brother, but most times when we experience anger, there's not a good cause. Jesus said, if we're angry with 
a brother without cause who shall be in danger of the judgment. And I'll just admit, I don't, I don't know if I really understand all the degrees and everything Jesus is trying to say, or Jesus is saying here. And I don't think we really need to take a lot of time to figure it out. I, I'm going to share a few things that I, I kind of feel that Jesus was saying. But I don't understand the culture, the Greek language well enough to say this is what he means. But he says you should be in, he'll be in danger of the judgment. Here again, I, I think he's talking about the, that, those judges that were set up for justice. You might be called before the judges to get this straightened out. And then he goes on to say that whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Council probably being the Sanhedrin. That word Raka or Raka means it's an actually from Chaldea origin and it means, oh, empty or worthless. You empty, you worthless one. It says you'll be, you're in danger of being called before the Sanhedrin for talking like that about your brother. But then he goes on to say that whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Thou fool. Have you ever called someone a fool? This word fool here, um, the word that Jesus here that's translated to fool is moros. That's where the word moron comes from. But it actually means to be dull or stupid, as if it's, it's shut up, you can't receive anything, you can't give anything. Morally blockhead, or you are morally stupid. You can't, you can't even understand what's right from wrong. You have absolutely no ability to decipher right from wrong. That's what this word fool means. And, and I, first when I read that, I had some other ideas, but as I, as I thought of that, I said, I believe that's why Jesus says you're in danger of hellfire. Why is the penalty so high for murder? Because we're created in God's image. And I said, it'd be better without you. Why is the penalty so high for saying thou fool or moros? Because you're saying you have no ability to decipher between right and wrong. You, you, you can't give anything, you can't receive anything. You're worthless. And they were made in the image of God. That's not my call to say that to a human being. If God wants to say that, he may. But for me to say that, I have no right to say that. And I'm putting myself in danger of hellfire. Now, what I do want to say with this verse, is to look at the degrees, okay? So maybe I could get, get by with saying, Raka, but don't say thou fool. If I am going to try to decide what words I can get by with in calling my, my brother and what words are going to cost me hellfire, then my righteousness is no better than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, and I won't make it to heaven. So that's what I say. I think it's well to try to understand what he's saying here. But if we're going to spend a lot of time trying to decide what's okay to say and what's not, then we have lost it. We've missed it. We've missed the heart of God. We've missed the heart of God. I'd like to also point out, because a question might come up, well, if it says, if Jesus held the standard this high, then why does he call people, thou fool? And why did Paul say, oh, foolish Galatians? So there was a number of times where Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees fool. But Jesus has the right to do that. He's the judge of the earth. Didn't he have the right to tell them, you don't understand. You don't even have any concept of what's right and wrong. 
Your mind is, is shut up. You can't even think straight anymore. Doesn't he have the right to say that? Absolutely he does. He's a judge of the earth. He's the one they'll have to give account to. He was doing them a favor by telling them that. He was giving them a chance ahead of time that they could hopefully get their thinking straight. On the road to Emmaus, our Bible says that he called those two disciples, O oh, fools and slow of heart to learn. That was a different fool. That was not morose. I don't think I wrote down what that one meant. But it was a different. I think, I think if I remember right, that was uh, ano anoitos, which means simply unintelligent, sensual, or unwise. It's a totally different, different degree. And also when Paul says, Oh foolish Galatians, it's not a moros, it's the other one. He says, You're unwise, you're sensual, you're earthly. Think about God's ways. So I wanted to point that out. There is a difference. God created me. God created man in his own image. And for me to pass judgment on him is an insult. To say he's a fool is an insult to God and his creator Jesus says that the anger is the seed of murder. And whether I cut my brother's throat or whether I harbor anger in my heart, I'm going to have to give account to God someday for that. Don't lose your place in heaven because of anger in your heart. It's not worth it. You know, sometimes when there's anger in our heart, I, I, I heard it here a couple weeks ago. A telemarketer, and I, I felt terrible bad afterwards because I was not trying to make, make him angry. I was maybe trying to have a little bit of fun with him, but I, I wasn't really. I, and I, I did not mean to make him angry, but he must have been having a bad day. I, was, I told him, you had the wrong number. And, I, and he tried to tell me he didn't. And anyway, we went back and forth a little bit. And suddenly he turned on me and just vented a whole row of profanity. There was anger in his heart. I felt really bad. I, I wished he'd... I said, thank you. I'm not sure why I said that, but I said, thank you. God bless you. And it went a little bit, and then there was a flick. Oh, no. I felt terrible. I, I wished I had then had an opportunity to talk to him because I had something to offer him. But that anger in a person's heart often explodes in words. And, and when a person can't, can't control what he wants to control, he uses words and name-calling. That's what that man was doing. For some reason, he was angry with me. I'm not even sure why. But he couldn't reach me. He couldn't hit me over the face. And so he calls me the worst names he could think of. Anger in the heart will express itself in various ways. But God doesn't have room for that. Let's go on to verse 23. Here, Jesus flips the coin. He says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I think we can understand this. In the Old Testament, they brought a lot of gifts to the altar. They had their first fruits, their, their, their offerings. They had their, the lamb they would bring. They had lots of sacrifices. And so I get the picture of a man, he's bringing his sacrifice, and he's, he's coming in the spirit of worship, and he's going to give this to the Lord. And then he remembers that. That incident that happened yesterday or maybe it was even last year or whenever. He didn't, he didn't mean to hurt his brother, but his brother is upset with him. He knows that relationship has been severed. Something has become between them. And it's not something that... He didn't do it 
intentionally. He didn't try to do, hurt him, but his other, the brothers offended with him. God says, and, and going back to our devotions this morning, that Brother Darwin had, he says, sacrifice is an offering I don't want, but I want a broken and a contrite heart. He said, go back to your brother. Restore their relationship. That's what I'm longing for. I'm longing for this relationship with you, but first go and restore your relationship with your brother because I can't even hear you. I, I, don't, I don't get this offering. It's worthless until you make it right with your brother. Go be restored to your brother. Well, I'm not the one that sinned. He, he just was offended of me. He just, he gets offended at everybody. Go and try to make peace with your brother. You know, sometimes we say things that we didn't mean it that way. We didn't mean it that way. We didn't mean to hurt him. That was not at all what we were trying to say. But our brother's hurt. He's offended. Let's do our best to restore that relationship. You know, I will also say I've seen situations where someone hurt another person. And that person find, found it hard to forgive the one that hurt them. And the offender recognized the sin and he went back and he asked for forgiveness. And I guess somehow he thought that everything should be cleared. But it took time. And so he was troubled by that gap. And so he'd keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And it just festered the wound and it made it worse. And so I believe here, if there's something I can do to bring healing to my relationship with my brother, let's pursue it. Let's do it. Let's do it before we, we can't get closer to God until we get closer to our brother. But if I've done everything I can, if I've gone back, I've apologized, I've done everything I know of and it still feels like he has something against me then leave it with God don't keep visiting it leave it to God and go back and take your gift to God but the passion here that Jesus has is that we be reconciled to our brother <coughs> God can't, God can't hear us if we're not right, if we're having broken relationships with our brother. There was a verse that I wanted to, to quote that had to do with uh, verse 22, and that's in 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. He that hateth his brother is a murderer. It's not just what I do, it's what I think. And you know, coming back again to the, my relationship with my brother, God spoke to me in that. Because it, I can also think that, well, you know, I've gone back, I've told him I'm sorry, I've, I've done what I can. It's, it's the ball's in his court now, it's his problem. And I say, probably my righteousness is not any better than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. I've met what the law requires. Now, you know, he's going to have to deal with it now. But is my heart to be restored? Do I long to be restored? Or is there still a little bit of resentment? Because you see, often what happens when a person's offended at another person, this happens in different ways, but sometimes when a person is offended by another person, they'll blow up and they'll tell that person what all they did wrong and how you hurt me. But in the same time, they, somehow they think it's okay to hurt them. See, that hurts too. 
When I, when I go to my brother and I tell him how wrong he did me and how he hurt me and how he offended me and he shouldn't have said it this way and how that made me feel, that hurts him. That really hurts him. So now I have done to him exactly what I'm accusing him of doing to me. And so sometimes I can say, well, I went back, I apologize, I tried to make it right, but in my heart I'm hurting too. So I don't really care to be restored. I don't really care for that restoration. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He wants us to be restored to our brothers. Don't let that anger, that grudge in your heart keep you from heaven. And then going to those last verses. Verse 25 and 26. Agree with an adversary quickly. Hopefully this is not your brother. I hope it isn't. This is, has the idea of someone that's taking you to court. You know, maybe you did something wrong and maybe you didn't. But this man's upset with you and he's taking you to court. He can't just call the police and have him come out and get you. No. In their culture... He would, he, I don't know how they did it, probably they'd get a couple of their buddies and they would grab you and they would drag you into the judges. And they would present their case. And it depends what the judge decided or how the outcome would be. And so as he's there, he's dragging you in. And he's saying, you know, you, you stole my cow you, or you ate all my sedan grass when your horses came into my field this morning. You destroyed my crop. It says, agree with him quickly. While you're in the way, while he's dragging you, you know, down the path. Whenever you can, get a word in there. Say, please, sir, let's talk this out. And if you are guilty, you know, offer restitution. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't think about what I was doing. You know, I'll pay you three times as much. While you're still in the way, don't wait till you get to the judge. Make reconciliation. And if you're not guilty, talk to him about it. Try to explain your case. Better to settle out of court. I mean, he might take you to the judge. The judge might say you're guilty. What does he say? And the judge would deliver thee to the officer. Then the policeman gets involved and you get thrown into prison. Try to settle outside of court. Whether it was your fault or not. Whether you're guilty or not. What is the typical response? I get angry. No, it's not true. I didn't do it. It's not fair. I'm being accused of these things. You know, I felt that way already. It's not fair. It's not right. You know, I'm... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demand my rights. It's not, it's, it's not, I don't deserve this. That attitude is not from God. Try to, you know, be willing to even take, take a loss. To be restored with your neighbor, your adversary, before the judge takes it in his own hands. God wants us to be reconciled to our brothers, to our neighbors. God is not only concerned whether we go out and cut our neighbor's throat, but he's concerned about our relationships. Love thy neighbor. Don't harbor anger in your heart. Don't let anger control you. Learn to take your anger to God. Anger is an emotion given by God. And some of us have to deal with it more than others. But learn to check your emotions. To take that to God. To say, wait a minute. I need time for this. I need to think this through. How does God want me to respond? That doesn't mean that we let sin go unpunished. Or, yeah, whatever we are called to do. That doesn't mean we ignore wrong. But it means we don't respond in anger. We stop. And we make choices 
based on what God wants. We won't let our choices keep us out of heaven. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, we pause before you this morning, recognizing that we are failing to you. Father, I confess this morning that many times I have just let the emotion of anger. Maybe it's been for you, it should have happened. We ask for forgiveness, Father. We ask for grace to live lives that will please you. We ask for 